Hi everyone, I'm Paul Tilley and welcome to Microeconomics EC 1110. We're, first of all, I want to say that we're working out of this textbook right here. So this is Sire Microeconomics and it's the seventh edition. So everything I'll be referring to here relates to the seventh edition of the textbook. This, in this section, I'm going to be looking at uh, some problems from chapters one, two, and three. And from there, I'm hoping, having worked through some of them, you will have a better understanding of how this actually works. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to take a look at chapter one assignment questions. Chapter one, we were introduced to the concept of the production possibilities curve, which is nothing more than an explanation of how our economy works. And the concepts there are relating to scarcity. That is, if we produce war, more of one thing, we have to produce less of another. So this very first example, in fact, deals with this. I'm reviewing 36A, and it's found on page 27. Table 1-4 contains production possibilities data for capital goods and consumer goods in the economy of New Harmony. And there you see Table 1-4. Use the grid in Figure 1-7 to draw the production possibilities curve for New Harmony and label it PP1. Label each of the five output combinations with the letters A through E. So what we need to do here is really to take a look at how the economy functions at its various capacities. That is, making a certain amount of capital goods, making a bunch of consumer goods. Okay, so if we look at this, we'll, we'll get it a little bit bigger here. So just wanted to see if we got capital goods and consumer goods. And we're looking at the various production uh, possibilities here. So let's look at the first one, A, zero capital and 30 consumer right here, we'll call that A. Uh, eight capital B is eight capital, 27 consumer, B. C is 14 capital, 21 consumer. We'll call that C. D is 18 capital, 12 consumer. 18, 12, D. And finally E is 20, and zero, so 20 over E. By joining the dots, this will indicate the, uh, the production possibilities curve. In other words, everything that's this side of the curve is possible in our economy. So any combination that works in there is possible. The ideal combinations are right on the line. That would indicate the economy is working at full capacity. So that's part A. So now we'll take a look at part B. Part B said, assume the people of New Harmony have decided to produce 12 units of consumer goods. And again, if we look here at consumer goods, there's the 12 units of consumer goods. Uh, how many units of capital goods can we produce? So if we just chase over from the 12, we will see that this mark right here is D, and it will indicate if we chase down that that's approximately 18 units of capital goods can be produced. So the answer to B is 18. C says, assume that the people of New Harmony have decided to produce 11 units of capital goods. And again, 11 units of capital goods is just about right here. Approximately how many units of consumer goods can be produced? So we just chase up here. And we will see that approximately 24 units of consumer goods could be produced at eight. And it's just a matter of chasing it up like this and across like that, and that will indicate where we are. What is the total cost of the first 14 goods produced, the 14 capital goods produced? Well, if you look at, again, if we look at the chart, uh, the capital goods go from zero to 14. So that's the first 14. We'll also notice that in going from zero to 14, we started off, if we didn't produce any capital goods, we had 30 consumer goods being made. As we produce more and more capital goods, the number of consumer goods drops. In fact, if we get out to 14, the number of consumer goods has gone down to 21. So we went from 30 
less 21, nine units of consumer goods given up. So there we got an example of nine units of consumer goods given up in order to make 14 units of capital goods. So that's how you do that. E, assuming the economy is producing at combination C, which is right here, or right here, what is the total cost of six additional consumer goods? Well, six additional consumer goods would say, okay, consumer goods, we're at 21. We want it to make six more, so we want it to make seven, 27. It's 21 plus six is 27. And we notice here, that, let me change color here, we went, in order to do that, we gotta go from 14 capital goods, which is what is made at 21, down to eight. So 14 minus eight would indicate that we'd have to give up six units of um, consumers given up. So that's how that works. F says, assuming the economy is producing a combination B, and again, combination B is right here. What is the approximate per unit cost of additional of an additional capital unit? So if we're going from um, if we're going from eight, let's say, and it says eight capital good, with additional capital good, uh, to go from eight to nine, there's nothing in the table to suggest nine, but it does say to fourteen. So eight to fourteen, that's a, a raise of six. And uh, 27 to 21 is a decline of six. So as we move this way, in terms of capital goods, we're making more capital goods, and we indicate how many we're giving up. So essentially, for every one extra we give up, six to get to there, and six are given up there. So basically, it's a, for every one extra, you're giving up one. So if we add an additional unit of capital goods, we're going to decrease an additional unit of consumer goods. So that's how that is worked. So you'd have a one decline. G. G says, assuming the economy is producing at combination C, again, this combination here, let me just erase some of this so we don't have too much mess there for you. Look at. If, we, uh, if we're producing at combination C, what is the approximate per unit cost of an additional capital good? And again, we don't have 15, but we're looking to see what is, it one, what is one more. So 14 to 18, we've got to give up 21 to 12. So 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, so that's four difference. We have to give up 21 to 12, so 21 to 12 is nine. So for, for a, a situation of going from 14 to 18, which is only four, we've got to give up nine. So it's essentially, it's around a two to one ratio. So we have to give up two consumer goods at this point for every additional unit of capital good we have. So the answer there is about two. We've got to give up two. H says, what's illustrated by answers F and G? Well, when we looked at F and G, we had a one-to-one -one relationship in F and a two-to-one relationship in G, that illustrates this concept of increasing costs. And when you look at increasing costs, or the law of increasing costs, it says as earnings, uh, as, we, as our economy produces more of one thing, we have to give up increasingly more of something else in order to allow that to happen. Um, I says, fill in table 1-5, assuming 10 years later. I'm going to go to 1-5 now. Here's table 1-5. Assuming 10 years later that the output potential of capital goods has increased by 50%. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's just hop back here and we'll see that capital goods is 0, 8, 14, 18, and 20. By increasing at 50%, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, that's 50% above zero is zero, 50% above eight is 12, 50% above um, 14 is 21, 27, 
and 30. So this is just adding a simple 50% to the original number. Okay, and then it says, while the output potential for consumer goods has risen six units for each combination. So we take the original amounts, the original amounts were 30, so it becomes 36. 27, so it becomes 33. 27, 18, and six. So effectively we just add six to them. So then it says using the data, draw the production possibilities curve in one seven. So I'm gonna hop back now and we're gonna draw the revised production possibilities curve. And what you're going to see, you're gonna see something, is, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about the exact numbers here, I just wanted to show you. The production possibility curve will shoot out like this. You're gonna see this type of shape. That's not exact there. But that will give you production possibilities too. So effectively it shifts out, shifts out more on the bottom because it's a percentage increase along consumer goods, whereas uh, along capital goods, whereas it's just a, uh, an amount increase uh, for the consumer goods. So the question, the final question says, as a result of the economic growth, can New Harmony produce 24 capital goods and 26, 26 consumer goods? Well, the question is really, is can it get that high? Now, we have, if we look at our table, we'll see 0, 12, 21. So 24 falls in here in terms of, in terms of capital goods. 24, uh, 24 falls in there. So, uh, 24 falls in there. So we asked ourselves, is, can you produce 24 and 26? Well, we'll notice that 24 is kind of halfway between 21 and 27, but 26, is it halfway between 27 and 18? No. So odds are, if we look at the production possibilities, this is gonna fall outside. So the answer is no. We cannot produce that, that combination. Our production possibility curve is still not far enough out. So that's, uh, that's that very first question. So you should be able to have a better handle on it now. I suggest you work through it and review the material in chapter one for that. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at chapter two, problem 36A on page 64. This is the next question. So uh, let me read the question. Table 12.2, and I've, show, uh, I've got a 2.12, shows the market for wool and the economy of Odessa. Plot the demand and supply curves on figure 2.16. So what we do is we simply draw a curve. So down here, we put quantity. Down here, over here, we put price. So what we need to be able to do is draw it. So we take our quantity and our price. So a price, at a price of 100, the quantity would be 130. Quantity demanded. At a price of 200, the quantity demanded would be 110. So you do this right through, and you'll end up with a line that looks like this. And this is our D1. Uh, then you do the same thing for supply. And again, at a price of 100, the supply is 10. At uh, a price of 200, the supply is 20. So what we do is we'll end up with a line like this. So this will give a, a reasonable facsimile of what's going on there. So we end up with this. And the question then goes on to say, what are the values of equilibrium price and the quantity at the equilibrium price? So you notice the equilibrium price comes about, it is the center here, and if we chase down, that's 50 and 50. Now, in fact, we can read it right off the chart. This is where 50 and 50, supply and demand are equal. So the price is 500 and the quantity is 50. C, if the price of wool were $600, would there be a surplus or a shortage? So if the price of wool is 600, again, we'll look at the graphic. If the price is 600, that means quantity demand is only 30 and the quantity supplied is 60. So there's more supplied than there is demanded. This would lead to a surplus of 30. And we can draw that, out. we can interpolate that from the graph too, because again, if the price is 600, I'll just draw this line across, that's the price right there. We'll see the amount supplied in this case 
is uh, around about 60, and the amount demanded, indicated by this intersection, would be around about 30, and the difference is 30, so this is surplus. So that's what that happens. Suppose that the demand were to increase by 60. Draw and label the new demand curve as D2. Here we have to uh, essentially, I'm going to clean off some of this stuff I've got here. Here we're looking at a, a new demand curve. In other words, the demand physically shifts. So let's just tidy this up a bit. I'm going to tidy this up a bit. And there's our demand and our original supply. Now what we do when the demand shifts, it says, um, suppose the demand were to increase by 60. So we physically count over 60 here. So what we'll end up doing is drawing a parallel line that's 60 units to the right. So this is D2. So that it's a D2 is a parallel line to the right. And in fact, we could, we could plot the points on that line, quantity demand, it's just add, so that's plus 60 to all those. 130 becomes 190, 110 becomes 170, 90 becomes 150, 130, 110, um, 90, and 70. So this quantity demand at 2, then this is where the numbers, the read numbers, and you can simply plot that on the graph. So in this case, it says, suppose, uh, draw the new demand curve. What would be the new value of the equilibrium price? So again, we need to be able to find our equilibrium price, and this is when supply and demand are equal. And you will notice that the new supply and the new demand are equal at a price of 700, right there, 70 and 70. And you can see that, illustrate it where it intersects, and you can see that goes across to the 700 mark. And at 700, uh, we see that the quantity supplied is 70. E, following the change in D, suppose that the supply were to increase by 50%. And in, the, in this case, we're looking at a percentage increase. So 50%, 10, uh, the quant original quantity supplied, we'll just add 50% to it. So quantity supplied was originally 10, becomes 15. 20 becomes 30. 30 becomes 45. 40 becomes 60. 50 becomes 75. 60 becomes 90. And 70 becomes 100 and five. So we've got those new numbers there and we simply replot the new supply line. And the new supply line, again, in the interest of time, I won't draw it exactly, but it will move non-parallel because again it's a percentage increase and it will create a, a second supply line. So this will be S2. And uh, the equilibrium then will be demand 2 and S2 right here where they cross. And that will be at a price of 600. And the equilibrium quantity then will be 90. And uh, so again, we can see that on the thing. It's 600, 90, 90. This is the new equilibrium price. So that's what you need to do for that problem right there. Next we're going to take a look at chapter 2, 38A, page 64. This is a pretty simple problem. All it says is that table 213 shows the market demand for supply of Fiji apples in Peterborough. What is the equilibrium price and the quantity traded? When we look for an equilibrium price, we're looking for quantity demand and quantity supply to be equal. You will notice that occurs at the 150 mark. So 150 Mark, and that is a price of 6. So the price is 6 and the quantity is 150. Suppose the supply increases by 30. In this case, the supply were to go up by 30. What would be the price and quantity traded at the new equilibrium? So in this case, we can go quantity supplied 2. And we'll add 30 to this. So 90 becomes 120. 
uh, 110 becomes 140. 130 becomes 160. Becomes 180. Becomes 200. And becomes 220. So what we're looking there now is to find out where those two match. So you will see that at a price of 4, quantity demanded and quantity supplied are equal at 160. So the price would be 4. And that would be 100. The quantity would be 160. After the increase, C says after the increase in supply, what would be the surplus or shortage of eight uh, at eight dollars? So if we look at the eight dollar mark after the supply increase, okay, the eight dollar, the quantity demanded was 140. The new quantity supplied was 200. So demand is 140. Supply 200. So this would indicate there, there's 60 in the difference. If more is being supplied in the mana, this is a 60 surplus. And that's how you do that problem there. Okay, uh, now let's take a look at chapter 3, 36A, page 39. In this particular problem, there's a bunch of little parts, and we'll start with the beginning. In A, what is the present equilibrium price and quantity traded in this market? If we look at the graph, We'll see that the present equilibrium is right here. That is indicated by a price of 6 and a quantity demanded, just drawing down, of 7. 6 and 7. B says, how much in total are rice buyers paying at this price? Well, that's simply 7 times 6. 7 being the quantity, 6 by the price, and that's $42, or $42 million. C. Suppose the government introduces a price, price floor of $8 per kilogram. So in this particular instance, then, what the government is doing is saying to them, okay, we're going to make sure that there's a minimum price out there. That minimum price is a floor of $8. And that draws across like that. And uh, it says, uh, how much in total will rice buyers be now will paying? Well, we look at the demand at $8, we just look at it there, and we'll see it's 6 million units. So 6 million units times $8 is 48 million, uh, 48 million. That's how much you're spending. As a result of the price floor, what will the total amount of the surplus be? Well, again, we see the surplus is indicated here. Suppliers are willing to supply this much, which is 9 million. Demanders are only wanting to buy 6 million. So the difference between 6 million and 9 million is 3 million. So there will be a 3 million surplus. And the question then becomes, well, how much is, how much is the dollar amount of that surplus? Well, 3 million times $8 3 times 8 is $24 million. And seeing government impose the, the price floor, they're the ones that's going to have to pay for it. So us taxpayers, basically. Suppose that after the imposition of a price floor, the demand for Shiba increased by 1.5 million kilos. So what we have is a shift in the demand curve, moving it to the right. So here we need to take, at each point, we need to move 1.5 to the right. So effectively right here and right here. So it will create a parallel line. And there it is right there. We'll call that D2. So that will create a parallel line. And it said, how much in total will rice buyers be paying? Well, at this point, you will see that line crosses the $8 mark at approximately uh, 7.5. 7.5 quantity, 7.5 times 8, 7.5 times 8, then would give us 60 million, 60 million dollars worth of, uh, of product. So the spending would be a total of 60 million dollars. If, what's the total amount of the new surplus? Well, in this case, uh, suppliers are still supplying 9 million. Buyers want to buy 7.5 million, so the surplus then is about 1.5 million surplus. And uh, the dollar amount of that is 1.5 million times 
times eight dollars. In other words, there's 1.5 million in surplus. It costs eight dollars per, so that's 12 million dollars. And again, the government would be responsible for that. Then we look G, and G says after the change, what would happen as a result of bad harvest? So bad harvest, what that's going to do is reduce the supply. So we're going to see the supply curve shift. And it says that uh, the quantity traded, total spending of buyers surplus gone down uh, by 3 million kilos. So in this case, what we're having is it, the supply line shifting 3 million. One, two, three. So we create a parallel line to here. So this is supply to. So we got demand to and supply to. And you'll see the equilibrium is above the price floor here. In this particular instance, then, the price would now become 9. You can see that that's what equilibrium price is at 9. And the quantity traded would be 7. 7 million. And that's a total of 63 million dollars. Uh, would there be a surplus or a shortage at that point? No, because equilibrium curve is above the equilibrium, uh, with below the price floor, is above the price floor, so as a result, uh, everything is being used up, so there's no loss. I hope that helped explain everything. Uh, if it doesn't, let me know. Thanks.